Dog Works Radio is sponsored by Alaska Dog Works. Check out their website at alaskadogworks.com. Start your day tomorrow with the Daily Dog with Michelle Forto, the morning podcast on Dog Works Radio. Apple podcast reviewer Patty Christensen calls it funny, smart, and filled with all the info I want to know about dogs. I love this show. Wake up with the Daily Dog, available on Dog Works Radio on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your shows. Mushing Radio presents the 1925 Serum Run. Subscribe to DogWorks Radio on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts to make sure you don't miss a single episode. Previously on the 1925 Serum Run. In January 1925, Dr. Curtis Welch of Nome notices an uptick of patients with severe coughs. After several deaths, he determines that the cause is diphtheria. An epidemic of diphtheria is almost inevitable here. Stop. I am in urgent need of one million units of diphtheria antitoxin. Stop. The Board of Health unanimously votes for a dog sled relay to bring 300,000 units of antitoxin from Anchorage to Nome. In Anchorage, a carefully wrapped 20-pound package of antitoxin is put on a northbound train where it meets the first dog sled team outside Fairbanks. It's 50 degrees below zero when the train reaches the first dog team of Wild Bill Shannon. It may have made more sense to wait until morning, but Shannon says, if people are dying, let's get started. Legendary musher Leonard Seppala, who is already on the trail, believes he's going all the way to Nalata with a team of 20 dogs. When the number of teams is increased, mushers are told to keep an eye out for him and stop him in Shack Tulik. But Seppala is out of range of telephone and telegraph, so he has no idea the plans have changed. Back in Nome, Gunnar Kassen, who has worked with Seppala and helped train some of Seppala's dogs, is told to head south as part of the relay. Kassen goes to Seppala's dog yard, where Seppala has given strict instructions that he's free to use any of the remaining dogs for company business while Seppala's away. But, Seppala says, if Kassen runs a dog team, he needs to run Fox, a brown and black husky, in lead. But as Kassin looks up and down the dog yard, his eye is drawn to a black dog with one white front leg named Balto. At the last minute, Kassin decides to ignore Seppala's wishes and places Balto in lead. Dog drivers take the antitoxin up the trail, facing temperatures more than 60 degrees below zero, wind gusts of more than 100 miles per hour, and severe blizzards. The antitoxin makes it past the Yukon River, across the Caltag Portage, and to the Bering Coast at Unalakleet, and then up to Shack Tulik. Past Shack Tulik, Leonard Seppala is flagged down on the ice of the Norton Sound by dog driver Henry Ivanov and given the antitoxin. He turns his team around and heads back north into a fierce headwind. Seppala realizes he's on an ice floe in the Norton Sound heading slowly out to sea. The wind changes and he's able to get close to more solid ice, but it's too far to jump, so he throws his lead dog Togo onto the ice and Togo starts to pull a line to bring the ice flow closer. When the line falls into open water, Togo jumps in after it, grabs it, and tows Seppala, the other dogs, his sled, and the antitoxin back to solid ice so the serum run can continue. After running hundreds of miles with his dogs to get the antitoxin, Seppala's team follows Togo more than 90 miles up the trail, about twice as far as any other team on the serum run. On February 1st, 1925, Seppala reaches Golovin and passes the antitoxin to Charlie Olson. Hours after Seppala leaves the Norton Sound, the storm breaks up the ice completely and floats it out to sea. Olsen and his team go 25 miles to Bluff, where Gunnar Kassen is waiting. The plan is for Kassen to take the antitoxin about 30 miles to safety, where Ed Roan is waiting. But with a blizzard raging, Welch recommends stopping the relay so as not to risk the antitoxin not getting to Nome at all. Nome Mayor Maynard sends out word to various roadhouses, including Safety and Solomon. Olsen and Kassen never learn about the ordered pause in the relay. Kassen heads into the storm and quickly encounters difficulty with huge snowdrifts. 
but Balto proves himself a good leader and finds the trail. This week, Gunnar Kassen and Balto make history. As the storm rages, Kassen's team quickly finds itself in whiteout conditions. The team runs on the frozen Topcock River, but Balto suddenly stops and Kassen sees there is a stretch of open water overflow on the ice. He takes a different route and turns off the river and continues. Balto leads the team over a series of narrow ridges near Topcock Mountain, a 600-foot summit. With the wind gusting, it's easy for a team or a driver to lose balance and potentially tumble off the trail to his death. It's a challenge in daylight under the best of circumstances, and this was the dark of night in possibly the worst of circumstances. The dogs crawl forward slowly, one step at a time. Kassen later said, Topcock is hell when it's storming, and it was storming plenty when he got there. With the dogs struggling for every foot they'd move forward, Kassen gets off the sled and helps push it up, trusting his dogs will keep him on the trail. At the summit, Kassen jumps back onto the runners as the dogs race down Mount Topcock. This is an area that is infamous to this day for its winds, and many mushers have been caught in wind tunnels that knock them off their sleds. The geography of the area, under the right conditions, creates a series of odd microclimates where it's perfectly calm one moment and then there are hurricane force winds the next. Balto leads the team around a curve in the beach and in the poor conditions, Kassen can barely see his wheel dogs. At one point, Kassen realizes he's passed the Solomon Roadhouse without seeing it. The plan was for him to stop there briefly before continuing to safety. Had Kassen stopped in Solomon, he would have received word that the serum run was supposed to pause and wait out the storm. But instead, he keeps going, figuring he's only about 10 miles from safety and can rest there once he turns over the antitoxin to Ed Roan. Shortly thereafter, Kassen hits a blowhole and an 80 mile per hour wind gust flips his sled and knocks him down. A second blast buries him in a snowdrift. Although Kassen is very tired, it's not clear he could have done anything to prevent the sled from tipping over, even if he'd been completely fresh. He writes his sled, sets the hook, and goes about the task of untangling his dog team. This takes longer than he wants, and he has to take off his gloves several times to get the dogs and gang lines in the right position. When they're finally ready to go, Kassen goes back to the runners and double-checks his sled bag for the antitoxin. It's not there. He gets off the sled and searches every inch of the bag. The antitoxin is gone. A frantic search of the area near the sled doesn't reveal the box containing the antitoxin either. Kassin cries out in frustration and drops to his knees. He looks over the area between where the sled overturned and where it stopped and methodically begins to search. But he can't locate the box. He starts crawling around in the snow, ignoring the cold, ignoring the frostbite on his cheeks. He even takes off his gloves, hoping his bare hands can give him hints based on the consistency of the snow. He's not sure what else to do. He has to find it. The bitter cold nips at Kassen's fingers, but he keeps searching. Eventually, his right hand smacks into the box. He frantically digs it up and puts it back on his sled, carefully tying it down with rope. He pulls the hook and is going. His hands are now badly frostbitten from searching around in the snow, but he doesn't care. Within a few minutes, the trail curves. Suddenly, the wind that had played Kassen since he left Bluff is at his back, propelling him and his team forward. The dogs keep running, enjoying the boost in their speed. Balto, in particular, is thrilled to be leading the way home towards Nome. As Kassen approaches safety, his team is running better than they had since they left Bluff. At safety, Ed Roan is asleep. Believing the relay has been paused and the message has gotten to Kassen somehow, he doesn't expect Kassen to arrive overnight, thinking Kassen will get to Solomon. He'll hold there until the weather clears. And even if Kassen does push on to safety, Roan figures, he won't arrive until at least six in the morning. But thanks to 10 miles assisted by tailwinds, Kassen is flying. He gets into safety around 3 a.m., on February 2nd, sets the hook, tends to his dogs, and takes the antitoxin inside to warm it up and see how Roan is doing. Roan is still fast asleep and doesn't wake up when Kassen arrives and comes inside. What Kassen does next remains controversial to this day. Although he is exhausted and his dogs are tired, Kassen decides to continue on to Gnome himself. 
He later says it would have taken longer for Roan to get up and get his dogs ready, even though Roan's dogs were rested and fresh. Some have argued over the years that Casson wanted the glory of being the one who brought the antitoxin into Nome himself, and Casson would definitely cash in on this fact for decades after. After a short rest, Casson decides to complete the relay himself. The trail from safety to Nome runs mostly along the beach, and by the time Casson is back on his sled, the wind has died down. But Casson and Balto are still facing a trail that has heavy snowdrifts, in part because of the blizzard that passed through. As many Iditarod mushers have learned, even though it might feel like you're basically a gnome when you reach safety, it's a mistake to take those last 22 miles for granted. Although the uneven trail slows down the team, Balto is able to lead them through, and Casson is grateful he can at least see the trail ahead. Several hours later, Casson recognizes the landmarks around Nome, and finally the cross of a local church. Around 5.30 a.m. on February 2nd, Casson and Balto pull up in front of the Merchants and Miners Bank on Front Street in Nome. There is no one there to greet him. No one even knew he was coming. A few locals hear the noise and go outside to see what's happening. They see Casson walking among his dog team, petting and praising them, and when he gets to Balto at the front, Casson says, damn fine dog, before he collapses with exhaustion. Ed Roan is still asleep in safety and has no idea the antitoxin arrived. There is famous footage of Casson's dog team led by Balto mushing down Front Street before a small but enthusiastic crowd. You may have seen this and thought it was wonderful that the end of the serum run was captured on film. But as with much of this story, the truth is a bit stranger. There were camera crews in Nome waiting for the end of the serum run, but they were all asleep when Casson and Balto arrived. 21st century reality shows aren't the only ones who believe it's okay to stage reenactments to portray some kind of greater truth. And the journalists of 1925 had no problem fudging the details to tell a good story. So later that afternoon, Casson and his team come down Front Street once again, this time for the cameras. By now, Welch has the antitoxin, but for the millions who have been following the story, newsreel footage that will play in movie theaters helps them feel they've reached a satisfying ending. But that's not quite the end of this story. Next week, what happened next? Did you know that Alaska Dog Works trains service dogs for those in need throughout North America? Each and every service dog that is trained through the Lead Dog Service Dog Program and Michelle Ford and her team has an individual training plan. We train for autistic, mobility, psychiatric, and PTSD for our soldiers for service work. If you know of someone that may need a service dog, please take a moment and check out Alaska Dog Works on social media and at alaskadogworks.com. Hi guys, it's Alex. If you are a fan of sled dog sports in the Iditarod, Mushing Radio is the show for you. Each Wednesday, we drop a new episode on Dog Works Radio. So be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. If you like our podcast, there are a few things you can do. You can take a couple of minutes and go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. You can also check out all of our DogWorks Radio sponsors and promotions in our show notes. Another thing you can do is go over to Facebook, like our Facebook page, and one last thing, please tell all of your friends by spreading the word about DogWorks Radio. Thank you so much for listening to us. We really appreciate you. DogWorks Radio is produced by Robert Forto. Logo art by Angry Squirrel Studios. DogWorks Radio is produced in conjunction with KVRF 89.7 in Palmer, Alaska. For dog training advice, you can contact Alaska DogWorks at 907 841 1686 or visit their website at alaskadogworks.com If you have a show idea or would like to be a guest please contact us 
by sending an email to live at dogworksradio.com.